Oh my god, hey, due to some spectacular bad luck and just a small amount of incompetence on my part, I have twice deleted the files uh, that made up this video. The first time I filmed another little bit to go on the end, you'll see that at the end of the video, and then while I was getting ready to export that, I somehow deleted the first 80% of the video. Uh, for various reasons, it was already on YouTube, so I was able to re-download a part of that, but essentially what you're going to see is a hybrid of two days of me filming this, and uh, unfortunately the first 80% is in a much lower file quality than I would like, and then has become standard in my videos, so I apologize for that, that you're not going to see my face in high definition. However, I thought about just not posting it at all and just never reviewing this show. I wanted to say my piece because I have a slightly different opinion to a lot of the other reviews that have been published, so I wanted to let you know what I thought about this show. I'm going to stop giving you a disclaimer now and let you enjoy what little files and sanity I have left. Please accept my apologies and enjoy this review of Kinky Boots. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my stage YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am an independent theatre critic and a content creator based here in the UK, and this is my stage YouTube channel where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see, and I talk about stagey news and drama and gossip happening worldwide. If that sounds like the kind of content that you would like to see more of on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. Also, go and find me on all of the other social media platforms. I talk a lot about other news topics that I don't necessarily get to bring to here on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, at Mickey Joe Theatre. Now today, I want to talk to you about a show I went to go and see recently, and for various reasons to do with logistics and a press night cancellation, I ended up seeing this a while after I was originally planning to, and specifically, a while after a lot of my other fellow critics. And this was quite a polarizing production, and some people, some friends of mine, had some thoughts about this production that I ended up quite strongly disagreeing with, and I want to talk to you more about why. So this video is going to be criticism of this production, but also a little bit of a defense of this production. So I want to talk about the changes made to this particular show. I want to talk about some of the strengths of this adaptation. I want to talk about some of its weaknesses as well, because there are plenty of both. So today we are talking about Kinky Boots. So for all of the context here, Kinky Boots was a musical that premiered on Broadway a few years ago based on a British film with a book by Harvey Feierstein and a score by Cindy Lauper. It originally starred Billy Porter, he won a Tony Award, the show won the best score over Tim Minchin's score for Matilda. I'm still not over it, I'm going to mention it, it was a travesty, but we move on. It then transferred over here to the Adelphi Theatre, it had a successful run, it went through a couple of casts, it closed, it toured around the UK, it filmed a pro shot, everybody loves a bit of Kinky Boots. It really resonated with a lot of the LGBT community, and for reasons I'm going to get to later, that in hindsight is a little bit odd. More on that towards the end of this video. But after the original production had come over here, played in the West End, closed, toured, and then that tour had ended, it allows the show to then have rights that can be distributed elsewhere, which means we get a buttload of amateur productions, which is what has happened this year. Just about every group in the UK is doing Kinky Boots. But also we see other venues offering their take on Kinky Boots. So this year has brought us the first regional revival of Kinky Boots. And interestingly, the first revival of Kinky Boots to really do something different with the material. Now this was a co-production between the New Waldsey Theatre in Ipswich and the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch. And the show has played a little run at both venues. I was originally hoping to go and see this in Ipswich, but I didn't get the chance. So I ended up seeing it earlier this week in Hornchurch. And I knew a little bit in advance about some of the changes to this production, and I knew that they were going to split public opinion. And I'm going to talk about why that is and my perception on it, but first I have to tell you why this version of Kinky Boots is so different to the version that you may know and love. So this version of Kinky Boots is directed by Tim Jackson, and from what I understand, he had a desire to make it a little bit more queer inclusive, a little bit more close perhaps to the original film. And so some of the differences in this production I think are born out of that desire and that kind of 
artistic agenda, and some of them are born out of the limitations of these smaller theatres and what they are able to achieve. Now, just from the off, it is a much smaller cast. You do not have dozens and dozens of factory workers. So if you've been to see the original production or an Amdram, which if anything is going to have even more factory workers, because if you know anything about community theatre, you know they like to throw as many people onto the stage as they can, because we like to involve everyone. And factory workers in Kinky Boots is a really easy way to just throw everyone onto the stage. But this is a considerably smaller cast and made smaller still by the fact that the cast also play instruments on stage. Now I'm reluctant to call this an actor musician show because for shows like Amelie or for shows like John Doyle's 2007 revival of Company, if you knew that, where these are called actor musician, this is because the musicianship of the performers who accompany themselves on stage is incorporated artistically into the show. They do clever little things, they do whimsical things, and they utilize the instrumentalism in clever ways. This is mostly just when the cast aren't being used in those scenes, they are at the back playing instruments. So as an example, Charlie's fiance Nicola is not present in many of the scenes, so she is playing guitar to accompany many of those songs when she is not involved in those numbers. Spoiler alert for the plot of the show, but Charlie's dad, Mr. Price, who dies in the first five minutes, goes on to rock out playing the drums for most of the show, having a great time. I'm like, good for you, dead Mr. Price. You are living your best life. But like I said, for the most part, they are just playing instruments at the back, which I have mixed feelings about, but this is not the time for my opinion. You're going to get that in the next section. I'm being very structured and organized today. This isn't like me. Normally it's a free for all. We'll see how long it lasts. Some other differences with the show. The casting of the angels is not necessarily how it previously would have been. In general, I think the cast is a lot more diverse, is a lot more disability inclusive than you would see in a normal staging of Kinky Boots, a lot more inclusive of trans and non-binary performers. And so in that sense, more widely representative of the queer community. And we have female performers cast as drag talent as well. It is very much not the sort of athletic chorus boys that you expect to see as the angels in Kinky Boots. This takes a very different and very welcome approach, I will say. The set is also completely different to the version that you will expect. I find it entertaining that the Amdram versions of the show are mostly using replica sets and replica costuming from the West End production. I should say I saw an Amdram production very recently, I'm not going to tell you which one, but it was a really great show. And it was interesting to see that in such close proximity to this version, it's made me very aware of the differences between the two. So you don't have that whole higher level sort of raised section of the factory in the back in this one. The stage is much smaller. The walls are all made out of shoe boxes, which I think is very cute. And you have some other little plinths and set pieces also made out of shoe boxes. That's very cute. You don't have the conveyor belts that they use. Uh, for the production line sequence in Everybody Say Yeah, there is none of that. There is nothing quite that sophisticated. There is a tassely curtain that comes down for the land of Lola, but for the most part, they make do with what they have. They have some big windows, they have a couple of doors, they have one little step unit that wheels around, and for the most part, they manage. Going back to talking about casting, one of the factory workers, George, who works very closely with Charlie, the one who insists on calling him Mr. Price, who had a very close relationship with his father, is recast here as Georgie and played by a woman, which very much changes the dynamic that that character has with Charlie. It's more of a maternal character. And this is because this character doubles up as one of the women whose voices we hear in What a Man, What a Man, What a Woman Wants at the start of the second act because we don't have enough factory workers to quite fill in all of those parts. So I think this change has been born out of necessity because the only women who sing in that section are Lauren and the newly female Georgie and the one female factory worker we have. When I tell you this factory is very thin on the ground for staff, there's really not that many of them. The score has had some changes as well. Some of the numbers have been rearranged. Soul of a Man has a much slower beginning until we get to that first chorus when it really kicks into the usual gear that you would be expecting. For the most part, a lot of the other songs are similar, but the size of the band has obviously been reduced. So you are getting a different texture to the sound, a different timbre, and it's not quite as full and in your face and broad way as you would expect. Generally to summarize, the vibe of this production and how it's shifted from expectation. It is not quite as Broadway. It is much more sort of small and subtle and intimate and a little bit more realistic and authentic to everyday life. So very much closer to the film tonally 
than what the musical has usually become. In an effort to make it more queer friendly and queer inclusive, there are also a handful of arguably transphobic lines that have been cut from the script. The whole reference about transvestitism and Winston Churchill is gone. A lot of Charlie's attempts to say transvestites that then subsequently he reworks as a different word, that is all gone. And while other than that first one, a lot of the jokes that have been cut aren't transphobic on the face of it, they do position the trans community at the butt of that joke in a way that's never really redeemed or never really gets called up on. But I'm gonna talk about this more in a little bit. Take a drink every time I say that I'm going to come back to something in this video. I'm shelving so much for later. I hope I remember this. And I did also notice that the last few lines of Charlie's voicemail speech to Lola in the second act, the bit where he very abruptly says, don't let anyone ever tell you that you can't be whatever you want to be or whatever it is that usually makes me cry, that is gone. And I do always find it a little bit of an unrealistic jump considering how much of a douche Charlie has just been in criticizing Lola for him after one sad song in the next scene to instantly be like, you can do whatever you want and be like this huge moral arbiter of individuality and self-expression when he's just been the main antagonist of that angle. So those are all the changes in this version of Kinky Boots as far as I can remember them. But what did I actually think of this and how did it affect the show? Now, I ended up giving this three stars, and I think it was an awful lot of heart and an awful lot of well-meaning, and I appreciated a lot of the changes, and a lot of the heartwarming aspects of the story still shine through, and these characters still shine through. I really liked some of the ways they had interpreted this material. I really liked some of the ways that it was staged creatively and innovatively, because when you have a reduced cast, when you have a reduced set, when you are working with less, you have to be innovative. My biggest issues with this show all come back to the presence of a band on the stage. Because if it's going to be smaller, if it's going to be less flashy, if the costumes are going to be cheaper, if the cast is going to be smaller, then you're portraying a version of the show that's more realistic to real life. It is less Broadway, it is less, oh my gosh, it's a musical number, all these things are fantastically happening, but we forgive it because it's a musical. It is more authentic. But that doesn't work as soon as you have musicians on stage. It cuts into the realism that we are seeing as an audience, and then we don't quite know what we're looking at. I don't mind musicians on stage, but I would prefer for them to be either subtler and sort of hidden away somewhere, think in Everybody's Talking About Jamie, where we know they're up there, but they're not distracting, and they're not sort of interfering with the actors on stage, nor are the lines between band and cast blurred, because people aren't going between the two. If you have cast members going into the band to play instruments, I would like for it to have some level of meaning, and there just wasn't meaning. It was really just to facilitate music happening. At one point, someone had a shoe that had been turned into a percussive shaker, and they made such little deal of it. I had to seek it out, because I was like, I'm hearing a noise, I see no one playing it, there aren't bands elsewhere, and someone's just shaking a shoe, like it's nothing, like that's not hilarious and brilliant. I loved that, then they put it on a shelf and they didn't use it again, and there was nothing similarly whimsical in terms of using instruments for the rest of the show. And so that was disappointing to me because I loved that moment. And if they had sustained that level of ingenuity when it came to the instrumentation, I would have been thrilled. The only other thing that comes close is when Don comes out at the end saying, look out Milan, here comes Don in his boots. He is playing the electric guitar, but arguably that kind of cuts into him completely giving himself over and feeling exposed and vulnerable to embracing everything that he's meant to be doing because he still has an electric guitar. So he's still like, Boots but manly. It's the kind of like, it's okay if it's glam rock angle, rather than just wearing the boots with his arms outstretched, embracing it. I feel like the guitar is kind of a barrier to that that he's hiding behind. Because it lets him still be a cool guy. He's not participating completely. But some of the other issues I had specifically with the band on stage is there are moments in Kinky Boots where the stage needs to be empty. You have Not My Father's Son, which is this important moment in establishing the lasting relationship between Charlie and Lola that the show is basically about. It's about these two t coming to understand each other from different backgrounds and finding out that they have a shared perspective that neither of them anticipated. But when they're having this tender, solemn moment, you have Will Arundel on the keyboard just staring down Lola because he's on stage MDing the thing. He is the onstage musical director. And so he has to look at the performer while he is playing these recurring chords 
on the piano and you're just waiting for them to look over at him and for him to awkwardly leave the room like he's just stayed there too long and he's listening in on this conversation. Like they're bearing their souls to each other and he's just in the corner like ding, 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 ding. And you have the same thing later with Soul of a Man. Everyone walks out of the factory except he's still there. And then because you have more instruments in Soul of a Man, you cannot do that song with just a keyboard. They all sort of sidle in behind him. You have all of the factory workers playing instruments while Charlie's like, they all left me, I'm alone because I was a douche. And they're all like, yes, we left him, we're not here. It just doesn't work. You need to see him alone and bereft and abandoned for that number to make any kind of sense. And yet, there was a lot that I did enjoy about this revival. I loved the staging of step one with adult Charlie playing with younger Charlie and throwing shoes around the factory. I thought that was really endearing. I thought that was also really clever and connecting with his childhood because he talks so much in this script about how he grew up around shoes and he has this connection to them and he has this whole thing where he's like, I was never passionate about shoes, but we learn through the material that he has this passion that he hasn't even yet realized in himself because every lyric that Charlie sings in his solo songs is a metaphor about shoes. Step one, soul of a man. And so to see the young Charlie playing with shoes, it's a visual representation of him remembering that from his childhood and it awakening something again in him, which I think is really sweet. And it gives the actor playing young Charlie something else to do. Now, I was ready to hate the staging of Everybody Say Yeah, because in the beginning, they were not doing anything with this number. And then once they've made the boots, they bring out one of the angels who sits down, they try the boots on the angel and they dance around while everyone else is cheering them on and then they join in in the dance. It's such a real, obvious moment, like, yes, of course that's what you do when you've made the first pair of boots, you're gonna get one of the angels to try them on and they dance around, they do a whole like, oh, I can't walk in them, I can't walk in them. Just kidding, yes, I can. Kick myself in the head, jump into the splits, it's amazing. And that really won me over. That was a perfect example of what this show is bringing. It's not suddenly here's a giant ensemble flying out, they're all wearing boots. It's realistic and they've thought about these decisions. I was with my friend who said in the interval, I don't want to see any more of the Mary Poppins ankle boots. And I get it because it's an ugly little ankle boot. However, I then started thinking about it because they should not have the flashy expensive boots until the end. The whole point is that they need sustainable footwear that isn't going to break. So we shouldn't see them during everybody say yeah, during Sex is in the Heel, during Land of Lola, wearing these amazing boots. Those need to be saved for the end of the show. Now the costuming has come under fire a little bit and I like the costuming. It is cheaper, it is tackier. They are not classy RuPaul's Drag Race outfits, but also nor should they be. You get the feel from the angels in this production that they are like, East London starving queer artists and performers, which is always the vibe I've wanted to have rather than looking like the finalists from a recent season of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. Like in hindsight, the angels in the original production of Kinky Boots, far too polished. When you have lines in the show like Lola saying, oh, my girls will fly to Milan and, and work for free. They'll just do it for the experience and the chance to walk a runway. It's important they don't look like they're people who walk a runway all the time. They shouldn't be these statuesque, gorgeous, leggy, athletic chorus boys. Also, because Lola has to talk Charlie into letting them be models, and the angels in the original production of Kinky Boots, of course they look like models, and they're all sort of similar builds and similar heights, and it makes perfect sense. They look like an excellent lineup of models. These angels have much more individuality and character. They're completely different heights and they all have much more of a personality. You get the sense that these are all different performers with different styles and that comes through in their movement, it comes through in their costuming and you feel like you're getting to know them a lot more. So Matt Corner plays Charlie Price. I first of all want to give him a shout out for sustaining a Northampton accent, not only when he is speaking, but when he is singing as well. For too long, we have heard actors singing this score just because it was originally written by Cindy Lauper, an American and performed by American actors. They go into Americanisms when singing Charlie's vocals. And it's that kind of like an American rocky sound, but you can absolutely still maintain a Northampton accent. And he does, and I appreciate that very much. The vocals that he brings are flawless and incredible and gravelly and 
just soulful. There's such a raw emotion in them. And he's a really brilliant Charlie. I love everything that he brings to this role. He gets the arc of the character. He gets all of the connections that he needs to have with the others. I do feel, as I do with most Charlie Prices that I've ever seen, that he reaches this boiling point in the second act a little prematurely. Like the level of hostility that he launches against the factory workers and against Lola isn't necessarily grounded in enough adequate exposition that we understand how he got there and it makes us dislike him as an audience more than I think we ought to for the show to then become successful. Keanu Adolphus Johnson is playing Lola, discernibly a younger Lola with a really great energy, brilliant performer. I am mad that Keanu doesn't get to be center stage with Charlie at the end of the first act and everybody say, yeah, they have Charlie go up the step unit and Keanu is just to one side on the floor, like, mirroring some ensemble members on the other side. No, it is about Charlie and Lola and they need to be side by side together in that moment because it's a joint venture. It's Charlie and Lola together and that is the point of the show. Arohan Galiva, whose name I am surely mispronouncing and I apologize, played Lauren and my God, the energy that she brings to this, the modern sense of humor, the vibes are impeccable. Every choice she makes is bold and ridiculous and I love her for it. History of Wrong Guys, is spectacularly stupid and just wonderful. And she's just grunting her way through it and humping the furniture and jumping into the splits and throwing herself around that stage. And she is just completely willing to be ridiculous and over the top. She takes this performance to everywhere I have ever wanted Lauren to go. She's down to earth. She's charming. She's believably smitten. It's just perfect. It is Lauren in Kinky Boots done to perfection. And I want to give one more car shout out as well. This is to George Lynham, who is one of the angels. George is an absolute standout in this ensemble, gets a nice featured dance moment at the end of the first act, and it's a stunning performance. They are captivating. You cannot watch anyone else during those ensemble numbers. They're just this beautiful, charismatic, engaging performer. There's performing choreography and there's performing drag choreography and queer choreography. And then there's doing it with personality and expression and joy. And all of those things are effervescing out of George as they perform. It is wonderful and joyous and I absolutely love it. And to answer another question in this same section, that is why Everybody Say Yeah becomes my favorite number in the show because the way that they stage the ending to that with George performing for the first time in the boots and everyone else dancing around them, it's, it's brilliant. It shows a brilliant awareness of what this show can mean. Now, I promised earlier I would talk a little bit about this show's relationship to its queerness. And Kinky Boots, because it is a show that features drag performers, and because it's a show about a man putting on a dress and putting on boots, and a man wearing clothing not normally considered for their gender, it has always been embraced by LGBT audiences. The role was originally played on Broadway by Billy Porter, who is a huge LGBT advocate. However, the rights holders for this show are, for one reason or another, adamant that Lola is to be considered and portrayed and depicted as a straight cisgender man. There is no room to expand on Lola's perspective on gender identity or sexuality. This is considered a straight man. Now, Billy... Do not ask me how, but I have managed somehow in my infinite capabilities to delete all of the rest of the footage of that video. So I'm going to carry on with what I was saying. Bear in mind, this is a few days later, so I'm going to attempt to articulate what I was literally in the middle of talking about. So I was saying, for whatever reason, the rights holders of Kinky Boots double down on their assertion that Lola must be portrayed as a straight cisgender man. Harvey Feierstein has subsequently confirmed this in interviews. Harvey was the book writer for the original Broadway production. Billy Porter played the role on Broadway. And Billy Porter has also said publicly that they did not get that message. Uh, and that is not how they were portraying the character. And you can see in several depictions subsequently that it is being depicted, the character that is, as a gay male drag queen. Which is, it's the expectation. I don't think 
many performers or audience members would question that that's who the character is. Every time I mention that this is something that the rights holders for the show still assert to be canonically true, people are shocked by this because you can see the show and walk away from it never realising that that's meant to be the version of the character that you're seeing. And I just find this disappointing because even though it has a message that resonates with the queer community, the whole be who you want to be, wear what you want, accept other people for who they are, even when that's separate to your own understanding of the world and your worldview. I think it's disappointing that with all the important dialogue that is happening right now and all of the terrible vilification and alienation of the trans community that is happening right now, that we could have a show that's plot is about accepting someone for the way that they choose to dress and to express themselves and it have nothing to do with gender identity, that we can't possibly conflate that with a conversation about gender identity or sexuality, that we completely avoid those as concepts. We will allude to them and we will make them the butt of the joke, but we will not valuably mention them because we don't want to alienate the valuable straight audience. That's essentially what's happening here, is they want this show to be considered commercial and profitable, and they don't want it to be coined as a gay show, because a gay show doesn't sell as well. That's the reality of the situation, because audiences who are straight, who are families, don't look at what they consider to be a gay show and think that that is going to be accessible to them or engaging or interesting to them. So they avoid it entirely. Or at least that is the perception of the people marketing these shows or producing these shows. Someone at the top has decided that Kinky Boots ought not to be a gay show, lest it become less profitable. And I think that's a great disappointment. But what this production that I saw in Hornchurch did attempt to do was to make it more authentically queer with the casting of the angels, with the rewriting of some sections of the script, with the amending of ladies and gentlemen and those to yet to make up their minds to include ladies, gentlemen, theys, thems, and you. It made it more inclusive of not only trans and non-binary people, but also of the audience themselves. And so I think while not all of their changes worked, I have to celebrate a lot of what they were trying to do with this production because it's so conspicuous to me that Kinky Boots has yet to consider itself an LGBT show or to loudly and proudly acknowledge its LGBT themes and this production tried to move it towards that direction but there was only so much they were allowed to change about the material. But those have been my thoughts about this new revival of Kingy Boots. The show has now closed at the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch, and there is no suggestion that it will have any further life, but it was really interesting to see this different interpretation. If you got to see this show at either the Queen's Theatre Hornchurch or the New Wolsey Theatre in Ipswich, let me know down in the comments section what you thought about it. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure you are subscribed to my Stage YouTube channel for many more reviews of other shows, including lots of other reviews of queer musicals and queer theatre. I have plenty that I've seen recently that I'm going to be talking about right here on my Stage YouTube channel. If you really enjoyed today's video, you can use the super thanks button down below to give me a tip. That really helps me to make all of the Stage content that I do very regularly. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash Theatre where you can gain access to some exclusive photo and video content. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>